Well, welcome everybody to this session in an ongoing series of conversations we're having at Hudson with leaders in uh, national security in the United States. Today we have uh, Senator Cory Gardner with us. Senator Gardner is the junior senator from the state of Colorado uh, who joined the Senate in 2015. Uh, he previously served as a representative for Colorado's 4th Congressional District from 2011 to 2015. So he's another one of these millennial job hoppers. Um, a Republican Col uh, and Colorado nato native, Senator Gardner holds a JD from the University of Colorado Boulder, and his BA is from Colorado State University. He's a prominent voice on national security and international affairs. He's on the Foreign Relations Committee and is the chair of the Subcommittee on East Asia, the Pacific, and International Cybersecurity Policy. Now, how he managed to redraw the map of the world uh, <laughs> to include cybersecurity in East Asia is actually a story which I hope he'll tell us this morning. But from this position, Senator Gardner has advocated for strong American leadership in concert with our allies around the world. Um, Senator Gardner does have to leave very quickly. There is a briefing he needs to get to. Uh, so at uh, 9.45, we're going to end our session right on time. And I would ask uh, our guests to stay seated until the senator leaves so that we don't obstruct his exit. <laughs> Uh, do you need that at all your talks? Well, no, I, yeah, I, that would help. It'd help us get out of the Senate, that, you know, that stampede that you always see so many people yes. on the Senate floor all the time to get out. <laughs> okay. Listen, Senator, you, it's interesting to me as, some, as somebody who cares a lot about American foreign policy, one of the things I often find is that uh, a lot of people, even in Congress and the Senate, aren't that interested in foreign policy slots on the national security committees aren't usually as heavily coveted as some of the domestic uh, uh, slots. What got you from Colorado, a state which, so far as I know, has no international boundaries, what got you into foreign policy? That's right. And uh, the beach isn't quite as good as other uh, places in, in the country. But, uh, I, you know, look, I mean, Colorado really has been a crossroads for uh, throughout our country's history. If you go back uh, several hundred years to uh, before we were a state and you look at the the part that we, we the role that we played, uh, parts of our state have been brought together from the Louisiana Purchase, uh, part of Mexico, uh, obviously with the trails and the outposts and the frontier days and the trade that took place. It has been uh, this great tross crossroads of commerce. And you look at today's industries that have developed in Colorado, uh, industries on software development, uh, telecom industries have been a, a telecom pioneer for decades. Uh, if you look at the work right now in, in aerospace, uh, aviation, uh, and you look at the work in agriculture, this is a state that relies heavily uh, on foreign opportunities, uh, international trade, and is a very, very pro-trade state. And when I came to the Senate from the, the House, uh, uh, I had served in the House Energy and Commerce Committee and spent a lot of time developing and, and listening about ideas of how we can use our energy policy in the United States to develop a very uh, significant uh, tool for foreign policy. Uh, giving a way for other nations in Eastern Europe, uh, in Korea, Taiwan, access to U.S. technologies, know-how, innovations, and, yes, uh, actual energy sources, uh, oil, natural gas, LNG exports. Uh, and that became such a significant talking point that it really led into uh, the Senate now where how do we take advantage of what Colorado has experienced? How do we take advantage of the tools we have as a nation on energy and then look at it from the opportunities around the globe, mm -hmm. overall economy, what our concerns are with security. And that's specifically what led me to, to Asia and what we need to be doing. Yeah, because that, that is interesting. When, when we've talked about foreign policy in the past, Asia has always been kind of at the center of your concern. Yet if you read a lot of the daily newspapers, sort of Europe and the Middle East seem to dominate. Why have you, as we might say, pivoted to Asia? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I think if you go to Congress day to day, you pick up the newspapers, you go to the House or the Senate, the day to day attention uh, that seems to be focused uh, is focused on the Middle East, uh, and rightfully so with the challenges that we have there. But in the meantime, we've we've sort of stopped thinking about a long term Asia policy. 
Now you have fancy catchphrases and slogans that have been developed over the past couple of decades, or this pivot or that balance, and I supported them. But we don't have more than a four-year or eight-year presidential outlook when it comes to Asia. And this is an area of, of, of the world that is so significant in, in opportunity. This isn't just a, this isn't an area of just problems. That perhaps there are other places around the globe that just problems. Mm -hmm. Asia is abundant with opportunities. Uh, this is an area of the globe that will soon possess 50% global population, 50% global uh, economic output, GDP, uh, an area of the globe that has uh, the largest standing armies in the world, some of the largest standing armies in the world. This is an area that has the uh, vast number of our, uh, majority number of our defense obligations uh, in Asia. It's where two-thirds of the people of this country will, will travel. It's something that, uh, you know, Congressman Randy Forbes has talked about in testimony before uh, our subcommittee. Uh, so, so it really is an opportunity that we should be looking at. And one of the things that uh, sticks out in my mind was a conversation I had uh, in the Philippines with, uh, with a leader there who said that, uh, in the, in the uh, foreign ministry, who said, it used to be that the, the Senate had people like uh, Senator Inouye, Senator Dole, Senator Stevens, people who were very much interested in what was happening in Asia, but they're gone. They've, they're no longer in the Senate. And so who, who replaces them? Who fills them? And I think we do have some more coming up in the Senate, but we need to be looking at Asia. Who are some of the senators that, that you think are Asia-focused? I think if you look at uh, people like Dan Sullivan, uh, who's uh, really been a great leader in a number of issues, had experience at the State Department before joining the state, uh, before joining the Senate for the state of Alaska, excuse me. Uh, you look at uh, his work on defense, missile defense issues in particular. Uh, somebody like uh, a, a Steve Daines, uh, who, who has experience in the business side of things, uh, living in Asia and working in Asia. Uh, it, David Perdue, the same, uh, spent time living, I believe, in Hong Kong and in China. Uh, on the business side of, of things. Uh, people like uh, Brian Schatz from, from Hawaii. I mean, there's, uh, there's obviously uh, people that are rising uh, mm -hmm. to, this, to this opportunity. What are the keys, do you think, of how does America demonstrate to Asians that we are engaged and that this is, this is a central concern? That's a great question. And, and I think there's, from, from the people who know Asia, the, the Asia better than I do, the people who are real experts, uh, live there, know the, the business, know culture, it, it's, a, it's a region of the, of the globe that really focuses on face, that really wants to not just hear about uh, the interest uh, of the United States in Asia or maybe read a, a, a policy paper about what we think and what we think is fine and dandy, but I think what, what we need to do is show face, to show that we are there. And that means that we have, uh, we have the presence uh, of U.S. government. We have visits by the president. I commend the president for taking a very extended visit to Asia uh, to, uh, I think, where we need to start that focus. That's uh, Korea, Japan, China, Vietnam, Philippines, both the APEC and uh, ASEAN opportunities. Uh, and to, to be there, to show interest, and to not just show interest, but to actually develop that interest into partnerships economically, partnerships uh, from a security standpoint, and to build out a longer-term uh, policy than a four-year, eight-year term of an administration. As I mentioned, let's create a generational Asia pol policy. We're working on some of that, but if we do that, then I think that, that's what this region wants. They, they want, a, they want a, a, a line to somebody other than China uh, on the rise, and we have to prove that we're up to that. Some people have called the U.S.-Japan relationship the most important bilateral relationship in the world. Um, what is your sense of U.S.-Japan relations? What are they now, and how do you think they could develop? I think the U.S.-Japan relationship is stronger than ever. I think it was, it was Senator Mansfield that had, had, uh, had stated that. Uh, and this is incredibly uh, important. If you talk to uh, the people of Japan, I think the affinity for the United States is at its highest levels ever. And vice versa, I think the, the affinity of the US, U.S. people, American people toward Japan is at its highest level ever. Uh, and so we should be capitalizing opportunities with, with trade. I was disappointed that uh, we did not move forward on the Trans-Pacific Partnership. I still hope that there's opportunities to move forward on trade, um, trade opportunities. But Japan, from a standpoint of changes that it has seen are necessary uh, for the security of, uh, of, of Japan, um, the defense guidelines debate that they have been having and going through, 
very important in a region that has some of the biggest flashpoints in America right now, in, in, around the globe, quite frankly. Uh, China, the rise of China, is it going to be peaceful? Is it going to be conflict? And certainly North Korea, which uh, is conflict. Yep. Um, where, where do you see things in North Korea? Uh, you know, this is uh, something that I think we have to take a lot of uh, professionals at their word. Uh, where Admiral Gortney, who was the previous combatant commander at NORTHCOM, stated that the situation on the Korean Peninsula is at its most unstable point since 1953. If you listen to General, to Secretary Mattis, uh, who stated that the uh, that North Korea presents the nation's most urgent national security threat. Uh, they're not just saying that because uh, they had a TV interview and they wanted to make news. They're saying that because it's real. It's true. It's a flashpoint that uh, we have to uh, deal with. Uh, you know, so so I have spent a significant amount of time both in uh, in Korea as well as uh, visiting with Admiral Harris, uh, PACOM, with General Brooks, with Secretary Tillerson, with Ambassador Haley about what we have to be doing and to achieve that, that goal, and that is peaceful denuclearization of the North Korean regime. And in your, from your perspective, is China doing enough? Is it doing more than it used to? How does the U.S.-China relationship play into this? I, I commend China for uh, having uh, at least not uh, gotten in the way of most recent United Nations Security Council resolutions doing more than, than has been done, but certainly not enough. Right. Uh, and uh, what, what, it, it, we all know that China is responsible for about 90% of the North Korean economy. Uh, there are uh, over 5,000, this was a study done by C4ADS, uh, over 5,000 businesses in China who are doing business with North Korea today. Ten of those businesses, ten of those 5,000 businesses are responsible for about 30% of the economy in North Korea. Uh, and uh, if, if, if China... And of course, President Xi just gave his uh, his speech to the to the uh, Congress uh, this past 24 hours, 48 hours. Um, China is going to be a, and I believe they should be and will be a, a a global power. Then they have global responsibilities, and the threat that we face with that with the rise of China is a question of whether it's a peaceful rise a rise that will result in conflict, and whether they will take the responsibility that they need to. Mm -hmm. And that responsibility is to address uh, a, a power on their border that is destabilizing the region that could lead to nuclear proliferation, if not worse, uh, and that they are so responsible for in terms of economic security positioning. They, they must be doing more. What frustrates me with China is that they have actually taken more aggressive steps towards South Korea's economy mm. in retaliation for the emplacement of the missile defense system than they have in retaliation to Kim Jong-un's depraved activities. They've cost the South Korean economy over $12 billion, shut down plants in China, had dramatic effects on retail operations both in China and in South Korea tourism, billions of dollars they've cost that economy. If they take that same concentrated approach to North Korea, we could actually be getting somewhere. Well, it's interesting that you seem to have studied the situation in South Korea in some depth in the U.S.-South Korean relationship. What's your view of that relationship? You know, I mentioned, uh, obviously, that Japan and the U.S. have a strongest relationship ever, and I think that's the same uh, with South Korea. Uh, this is a relationship uh, forged in blood, uh, a relationship that we are committed to uh, by uh, treaty obligations to defend 30,000, near 30,000 U.S. personnel, men and women in uniform, uh, in South Korea, uh, we are committed to the security uh, and uh, the success of South Korea. Uh, and uh, I do think we have a very strong and growing, even stronger relationship from, and, and, and you know, oftentimes you look at it through the guise of, of that security relationship, but it, we have tremendous uh, opportunities from an economic standpoint, uh, and uh, the, the strength of the Korea-U.S. free trade agreement shows what we can do from an economic standpoint as well. Uh, but But we have to continue making sure that we increase the strength of the alliance, that we never leave any doubt or daylight uh, in, in the alliance and what people think the U.S. will do or won't do. Uh, and we have to make sure that the alliance becomes more than just the United States and uh, Korea, that we also emphasize the importance of Japan to the success of the U.S.-Korea alliance. Uh, 
uh, and that Japan and Korea, significant historical differences between the two, uh, are able to move toward a point of uh, security opportunity and need because it's there. So you would see somehow, we, right now we have two bilateral relations with these countries. Are you thinking we should be looking toward some kind of more ambitious architecture in the region? I, I think there is an informal architecture, obviously, between uh, the United States, uh, uh, Korea, and Japan. And whether people will use words like that to describe it, uh, that's, that's up to them. Mm -hmm. But what I think we have to do in order to make sure we have a, uh, the appropriate response efforts and uh, the policies directed to uh, denuclearize the Kim regime, that, that sort of trilateral relationship is critical. And it's also critical, not just toward North Korea, but it's critical toward uh, what happens uh, with China. You and I have spoken about uh, the rule of law, Western systems of values, uh, human rights issues, uh, the regional uh, challenges that we face and opportunities we face from uh, you know, Southeast Asia to uh, throughout uh, Korea, U.S., Japan, with common interests, common values, uh, can do tremendous uh, good uh, in this relationship. And actually, as, as you were talking, I was thinking, I'm not sure we should call these Western values anymore because, yeah. you know, Korea, Japan, Taiwan, there are a lot of Asian countries that, yeah, right. that are really leading the way in some of these ideas. So uh, it, that may be an old-fashioned right. uh, term that we use. Um, you mentioned India, and uh, I know Secretary Tillerson is about to go and has made a made a speech before he left. Where, where do you see India fitting? I realize it's not part of the jurisdiction yeah. of your, your subcommittee. This is, this is a sore point with me, uh, this uh, subcommittee issue. You know, if you look at the way the State Department is structured, if you look at the way the Department of Defense is structured, uh, they, do a, a, they, they do sort of recognize the importance of an Indo-Pacific policy. Uh, for whatever reason, Congress, so I guess there's lots of reasons Congress can get things wrong, uh, but uh, for whatever reason at the International, excuse me, at the Foreign Relations Committee, uh, we put India in a different subcommittee than the uh, Asia uh, subcommittee. And I think if we're going to be successful in efforts that, for instance, the, the Asia Reassurance Initiative Act that I am uh, in, in promoting, if we're going to be successful in that type of policy, we have to look at this as an Indo-Pacific type of opportunity. Uh, and Secretary Tillerson, I think if you, if you haven't had a chance to, to view his comments uh, yesterday before CSIS, I think it's very worthwhile read to get a, a, a good picture of what uh, the opportunities that lie ahead with India. I mean, uh, they will eclipse uh, China in, in population. Um, this is an incredible economic opportunity for the United States, and from a, a security standpoint, the partnerships that we can begin promoting in uh, Southeast Asia, I think uh, with the elevation of uh, India to a major defense partner, uh, this shows the significance that we are placing uh, in that. And conversations with Harry Harris, uh, talking about how uh, every chance he gets to view this relationship uh, through so that Indo-Pacific relationship, uh, very important to, to do. And, uh, We've got to grow that. I had the first opportunity to visit uh, India back in 2007, uh, and uh, you could just sense the excitement uh, for those partnerships with the United States, and we need to capitalize on it. They're, they're uh, the world's largest, uh, largest democracy. A lot of common values that we should promote. And soon to become, I think, in population, the world's yeah. largest country that way, too. Um, it's also interesting to see that India-Japan cooperation is deepening. How do you regard that from your perspective? I think, you know, there's, this is, you, you have the values, right? The, 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 the values of, of, of democracy and you have uh, other shared interests and values, certainly economic opportunities, but uh, security opportunities are real. Uh, and that counterbalance uh, in the region. Uh, it's pretty obvious that uh, you have a nation that is very wary of uh, some of its other bordering uh, neighbors uh, that, that we also are uh, worried about right now, and to have that partnership with India, uh, to have that partnership with India and Japan, uh, I think can can help uh, stabilize those values in a region for generations to come. As nations who may not be interested in the rule of law or stability, uh, or perhaps as Secretary Tillerson said, uh, sort of predatory economics uh, that India can be used to help offset that. Mm -hmm. um, Predatory economics, what, what do you mean by that? Yeah, I think it was a really interesting term. It's something that we've talked about, it, 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 just seeing how uh, China, others may uh, work with the nation on financing a project, building a port, a transportation system, very grand plans to uh, tie the region back together to China. Done so in a way that 
uh, may not have the most favorable economic terms to the host nation, uh, oftentimes ending up in a, in a heavy debt situation that the nation, and as Secretary Tillerson talked about, uh, can't uh, fully comply with, and then you end up in an equity situation. Uh, so the jobs don't materialize, the debt materializes, and then the equity goes to uh, it goes back to uh, the lender, so to speak. And so, I, I, thinking about Sri Lanka, when we uh, there, there, there's there's some that come to mind. And so, I, I think this is a, a situation where India fits naturally into a partnership of hey, there's better ways to do this, and we can have these conversations how to partner uh, around the globe. And again, it's it's not about uh, you know trying to tear somebody down. It's about trying to build the right side up. Okay. Um, I guess we haven't mentioned Taiwan uh, in this uh, certainly a very interesting and important place. How do you view U.S.-Taiwan relations and their relationship to U.S.-China relations? Uh, I, I, again, I think our commitment to Taiwan uh, is, is, is firm and remains as firm as ever. And I think we have to have a greater resolve when it comes to certain uh, obligations that the United States has uh, toward Taiwan. Uh, I was a part of the first delegation uh, to visit uh, President Tsai after uh, the inauguration. Uh, I guess this has been was it just uh, two years ago now, last year. Um, but just a week or two after she took office, talking about these opportunities to build uh, further and greater cooperation. Part of the legislation that I'm pursuing, the Asia Reassurance Initiative Act, uh, will take a couple approaches to uh, Taiwan. Number one, reaffirm our, our defense commitments and obligations. Uh, number two, routinize or regularize, I can make up a couple of other words if we need to, uh, the arms sales of the United States to uh, Taiwan. Uh, I think what happens oftentimes is we, we have a lot of debate in Congress about these sales, big numbers, big sales. Uh, they take years and years and years. And then it becomes sort of this, this, this peak argument, and it draws a lot of attention, a lot of aggravation. Uh, we do it, and then we don't do it, then we wait because so much political capital got put into that, and then it takes too long for the next one, and then it builds up this big argument again. If we re regularize the sales, then I think it will be a better approach and take out some of the, 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 the conflict that goes to the argument around this. So that sort of a steady flow of lower levels rather than an interrupted flow with some big headlines. With, with big headlines and rhetoric, that's right. Yeah, yeah. That's right. okay, no, that's, that's interesting. Um, but we also haven't talked about, you know, the South China Sea, there's so many, and this is what yeah. makes Asia so, uh, so incredible, the challenges that we face there, obviously with the uh, South China Sea goes directly, and, and President Xi talked about South China Sea in his, uh, in his speech, three and a half hour speech, that you used to see that in the United States Senate. Uh, uh, three and a half hour Three and a half hour speeches. speeches. Uh, you don't see it anymore, people will be sleeping. Um, the the the, uh, the the South China Sea he talked about it, but I mean again it goes to uh, the, the the concern that this is a militarization rise. Mm -hmm. So, are, is the U.S. in your view doing enough about Chinese activities in the South China Sea? Not enough or too much? Yeah, I, I agreed with uh, I, could, I think it was uh, Secretary Carter who said uh, the United States will fly, sail, operate anywhere, everywhere uh, the international law allows. It's, it's a horrible paraphrase, but he said something to that effect. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we must continue to do that. Uh, I, I worry that the previous administration did not follow through on that statement, and I want to make sure that this administration uh, is following through on that same policy that I think we should adopt. And so uh, part of our effort through the legislation would be uh, to, to create uh, additional uh, operations through South China Sea exercising our rights under international law uh, to continue to, to demand that International law be followed, recognize the the the, the tribunal uh, be be followed through, uh, and that uh, we respect international law, and we must continue to do that, to insist on it, and to operate as Secretary Carter said in a way that shows uh, we mean it. Yeah, I, I'm not sure that China fully understands the role that freedom of the seas plays in U.S. history. That. Uh, more of our wars have started over this issue than than any other war. And so if you wanted to have a war with the United States, interfering with free navigation in international waterways would be a great place to start. <laughs> and, and, you know, and uh, this is 70% uh, of our trade is going to be making its way through this area. Uh, where's the next South China Sea crop up? And if we don't put uh, a marker down on this to make sure it doesn't continue, uh, 
um, there will be more. It's also vital to Japan's economic security as well. So, and uh, usually when we talk about war started by water, we're just talking about Colorado and Kansas. They have better, <laughs> they have better, better lawyers than we do. Uh, it's, a, it's a concern we have. That's bad. <laughs> well, you know, we've been talking a lot of very ambitious ideas about American presence in Asia, reassuring people, increasing commitments, clarifying commitments. I think one thing that people around the world are wondering as they look at American politics is do the politicians saying these things have public support? Where is American public opinion going on foreign policy? How do you think about this problem? Yeah, that's a, I mean, that's obviously goes to the heart of the debate we're having now on things like the Trans-Pacific Partnership, engagement in the Middle East and uh, places around the globe where the American people are, are um, weary, suspicious uh, of uh, engagement at times. And uh, quite frankly, policies in, in Washington have probably led them to that uh, suspicion. And so, but, but bad, you know, you, you look at the times where the United States has had outcomes that we would have preferred to avoid, wars, conflict, it's those times that the U.S. has withdrawn that some of our greatest challenges uh, have emerged. And so what we must do is recognize that the American people want um, a, a better understanding of what it is that their leaders are, are pursuing, and they deserve that. Uh, one of the ways we got to think about it, you know, we, we've been looking into some of the work and thought that's been uh, been written, carried out by Henry Now, professor mm. over at George Washington University, talking about sort of this idea of conservative internationalism. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and one of the, 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 the ideas that has been out there, of course, is always addressing you know, liberal internationalism, realism, national, uh, nationalist approach to foreign policy. Uh, look at the engagement that George W. Bush led versus the engagement that Barack Obama led. Uh, and what, what the American people are sort of saying about it is perhaps there is a different way to approach this. Uh, and if you look at uh, the, this notion of uh, conservative uh, internationalism, um, it, it has sort of the, a, a combination of uh, the realist approach, uh, balance of powers. Uh, it has a combination of engagement, diplomacy, uh, force, but it also makes a priority of the systems and says, mm -hmm. where is it in our interest to pursue democracy? Uh, is it in a nation that has no, uh, no hope, no uh, feeling, no experience with democracy or freedom? Uh, is it a border state? And I think that's sort of the prioritization. Let's make sure that we're looking out for our interests and allies. Uh, I think they recognize sort of like the three areas of, of uh, borders where we should take a conservative internationalism approach. But, you know, maybe an approach like that that you can explain to the American people that this is the interest of freedom, our allies, and where we know uh, it's in the best interest of the United States to engage. What about on trade, where, again, there's been a lot of controversy and a lot of public questioning of sort of things that have been taken in policy circles as orthodox, not to be challenged facts. This is, I mean, if you look at trade, I mean, it's, it's a hard thing for uh, people to, to uh, try to talk about in a coffee shop with, with voters because uh, if you've had an experience in your, in your hometown, uh, the, the local factory closed uh, and 30 jobs were lost because it can be done uh, somewhere else, so those goods are now coming from somewhere else. That's a big micro impact, uh, and that community feels it. They know it. Their family may have been a part of it. They saw the hit to Main Street in their community and what it means to them. But if you look at the numbers nationwide and the macro impact is, oh, we've added jobs, uh, of course, well, then macro uh, speaking, economically, uh, what a great thing it is. And so we've got to have that conversation and help, help understand what the, the, that, that sort of split between the micro-macro impact is and how we do benefit from trade overall. Uh, and that I, 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 you know, I don't, I worry sometimes that, that any attempt to, to cut off uh, trade or slow trade or stop trade is based on a belief that the United States can't compete anymore. Shame on us if we think we can't compete. Shame on us if we don't think that we can change our, 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 or innovate our way to being the most competitive nation on earth. We have a tax code that is so cumbersome right now that people are leaving. We have a regulatory environment that's driving people into lethargy, you know, some kind of a, 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 a state of uh, immovability. Uh, we can fix that. We should change that. 
Uh, we don't have to be stuck with the same tax code. That's the debate we're having right now. We shouldn't be stuck in a regulatory state that says, hey, if you want to do anything to innovate, uh, you're going to have to go through 10 years of studies, $14 million worth of reviews, a couple of lawsuits, and by the end of it, you'll, you'll probably be dead, so you don't have to worry about it. Uh, I mean, this is, this is ridiculous. So, uh, but let's, so let's not look at it from that standpoint. Let's look at it from opportunities, innovation. That's whole of government innovation, not just uh, private sector innovation. Uh, and uh, realize what it means to us from a standpoint of, of economic interest, bettering people's lives, leaving more money in consumers' pockets, growing wages, but also what it means from security. Because if we disengage trade in Asia, uh, then China's the only ball game in town uh, for anybody. And so that, uh, just another reason why we can't economically and security uh, standpoint. So you would still like to see TPP somehow? I would still like to see TPP. I thought maybe we'd rename it to call it something else and move forward with it. Uh, Some people suggest if we added another T. So I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know who would ever say that. I've never heard that before. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, I think these are opportunities that we should pursue. Uh, you know, just a snapshot of Colorado. There's about 750,000 trade jobs in Colorado. 250,000 of those trade-related jobs come from the 11, 11 other nations uh, in TPP. Uh, and uh, so th this, this, these are great opportunities for us. Uh, and... I, I, you know, this administration wants to move forward on bilateral agreements. Let's move forward on them. Let's get them done. They're going to take time. And that's what I worry about, how long it will take. And then maybe there's some political uh, interests within their nations that are going to prevent them from moving forward in a bilateral manner that they, they're able to overcome if you did a more multilateral uh, level deal. So but, but when we sit back, uh, it creates a vacuum. And in that vacuum, everybody else sees opportunity. And they're driving it. They're going for it. We can't, we can't be left behind. All right. um, I noticed that while your subcommittee doesn't have India in its remit, it has another very large uh, area, cybersecurity. Yeah. How did cybersecurity become part of the East Asia subcommittee? of the foreign relations. Yeah. Before I answer that, I do want to talk about I am trying to to take take India into the committee's jurisdiction by adverse possession uh, or or you know so slowly trying to just just make sure people think it's ours and then it'll happen, right? It's a little bit how we uh, involved ourselves in cyber. Um, you know, this is an area where we can't just look at cyber from a standpoint. I think the problem with cyber is we we've, we've approached it too much from a, a siloed standpoint. Uh, we've looked at it from a standpoint of intellectual property. We've looked at it from a standpoint of uh, security risks, uh, of whether or not somebody can penetrate the infrastructure of the United States and steal defense plans uh, or weapons systems. The answer appears to be yes. Yeah, on all of them. Uh, and, and, and so uh, raise your hand if uh, you think uh, China has your, your fingerprints. Uh, I think uh, most people would raise their hand. Um, so this is a, this is a, a scary um, asymmetric area. Uh, and the way we ended up with it in committee, looking at the need to address this, not just as a defense issue or a, a IP issue, to look at it as a foreign policy issue. Um, I said, do we have cybersecurity in the jurisdiction of the Foreign Relations Committee? And they said, no. I said, well, can we name our subcommittee <laughs> the cybersecurity subcommittee? And apparently you can. Uh, so again, adverse possession. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, it, it it does seem right now that almost every day you pick up the paper and there's a story of more crown jewels of either the government security or your personal information has been stolen and often the suggestion that it's uh, foreign agents that have, have, have accomplished this. How did the United States, the home of Silicon Valley, the great innovator, how did we convert ourselves into you know, the sort of universal patsy of cybersecurity. <laughs> That's, I, my God, I mean, my gosh, you look at you do, you pick it up every day and you see this. And, and the, the theft of data from the credit rating agency uh, experience, I mean, if you, if you look at that, I, that's, I heard more comments, concerns about that going home than most other issues. Mm -hmm. Because it was, number one, so significant, so many people, right? But number two, uh, that's personal. It's real. It's not like hacking a movie at Sony. Uh, and releasing a movie, uh, it, it's it's everything that person is. It's their credit card. It's all their banking. It's everything. So so it's really personal, um, and it's asymmetric. And the cost of doing it are cheap, because if you if you can find a guy and you pay him a little bit of money, or maybe you don't pay him, you say hey, here's your you're gonna have food if you uh, if you do this. You don't if you if you won't if you don't. Uh, and 
uh, you have a couple lines of code and a keyboard uh, for, for a couple hundred bucks uh, and access anywhere around the globe to an internet system, you can do this. Uh, and y you don't need a, a, a billion dollar uh, army, a billions of dollars of defense equipment to do this. It's cheap, it's easy, and it's effective. And, and not only does it undermine the actual equipment technology and systems, right? It undermines our, our, our psyche. It undermines our, our thinking about institutions and our trust in those institutions. I mean, the day that people go into the bank and their decimal points off by a couple dollars, the day a hospital uh, sees that the, the prescriptions in their systems have been changed by a milligram or two, that trust collapses. And it is frightening to think the consequences. And so I don't think that the U.S. is, is, is I don't know that any nation is, is structured enough to deal in an appropriate manner to deal with this new era of cyber asymmetry. It almost feels like we've got bank robbers going up and down the street, looting every bank, and there's no police force. Yeah, and see, I think that's a great way to look at it. And I, I, I heard you say that earlier, that if, you, if, you, if somebody comes to your house, breaks in, steals the TV out of it, something has gone wrong, right? Somebody didn't do their job. The police didn't do their job. Local law enforcement didn't do their job. Uh, the neighborhood watch program failed. It didn't work. But when you turn on your computer, you log into your bank account, uh, and you know there's a ransomware that's been installed. There's something that's been there. Who who's responsible for that? It's just it's just it's this wild wild west. It's this frontier. Uh, you know corporations when they see that their their plan for a certain chemical has been stolen. Uh, you know who 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 is there saying yep we're 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 on the case with you know it's the you know we're on the case with the magnifying glasses. How do we do that? So we, we've supported a couple initiatives uh, that I think are very critical to help get us up to speed, but. Uh, this is an asymmetric threat uh, in an area that is not going away. Yeah, and as you say, it involves corporate interests. You, you know, the, you fear that the utility might be hacked. Right. Or, I mean, it's it's national security and personal security. I'll give you an example of the utilities. This is just an, it's, we had a hearing uh, on the uh, with some utilities here several months ago. I also chaired the Energy Subcommittee, the Energy and Natural Resources Committee. And we had a cyber hearing. And we had a utility executive testify and tell us a story. They had hired an analyst to come in and go through their uh, utility to tell them what was working, what wasn't working, you know, what they needed to do, what they needed to change. Uh, so they sit down after the, the, the survey is through, the, the, and the analyst is saying, they're saying, hey, and by the way, you got a piece of equipment in your control room that would never be allowed in a federal uh, facility. And, and, and the, you know, the site, the, the, IT team at the utility says, great, which piece is it? We'll fix it. And the guy says, well, I can't tell you it's classified. It sounds like a joke, but this really happened. Uh, and so, so we've got to fix this. We need to, we approach in Congress again, everything by committee. And we have a judiciary committee that, that deals with IP issues. We have an armed services committee that deals with the security issue. We have a foreign relations committee that deals with the, the treaty aspects of it and the foreign relation aspect. We have uh, homeland security. Let's take a, let's create a cyber committee. First time ever, let's create a, a select committee on cyber. Let's take the chairman, ranking member of each committee, put them on one committee, give us a whole of government view of this. Let's start addressing policies on things like cyber vulnerabilities. Uh, we, I was able to get a, an amendment to the Defense Authorization Act that would address critical infrastructure systems um, that come from uh, nations that we are worried about and uh, related software and others, you know, whether it's Kaspersky, whether it's uh, you know, Russia, Iran, uh, North Korea, what systems are we worried about are vulnerable in this? And to get an inventory of that, and the comptroller is now uh, going to be required to do that if this language is, is adopted uh, and signed into law. It's already in the Senate bill now. Um, Let's, uh, yeah, we, we purchase billions of dollars. The federal government purchases billions of dollars a year uh, in, in Internet of Things devices. Let's make sure they're safe. And this is, if, if we're going to have billions of IoT devices attached to the Internet, which we are going to and do have, uh, those create entry points. Uh, every single one of them is an entry point and creates a vulnerability. So when the government started to do this thing, maybe we can drive private sector best practices by uh, through a procurement practice because we have such a high volume of purchasing. Let's make sure that they are patchable. Let's make sure that we know their known vulnerabilities. Let's make sure that we can have an opportunity to do security testing. And I always, it's a white hat or white knight. I, I get uh, confused sometimes on the type, the, the names, but the people who can do that testing of vulnerabilities. Uh, let's, let's make sure that there are the appropriate segmentations and firewalls in place. You know, I spoke with the CEO of a tech company who said, 
most of the attacks that we have seen that have been so public could have been avoided with some very pretty basic uh, computer hygiene uh, type uh, policies. Yeah. Well, this, by the way, strikes me as one way to connect public opinion with the need for foreign policy, because you know it, what's happening in in Korea may be thousands of miles from your living room, but what's happening in cyberspace is right there on your, your kid doing their homework is connected now to this global, unpoliced, lawless zone. It really is. I mean, and, and I think that makes it so so personal. I mean, this is long gone are the days of the Oregon Trail uh, on your Apple IIe. I mean, that is now going around the globe and connecting everybody to the Oregon Trail right in your, your living room globally, uh, so to speak. And so, uh, you know, what's the, what was the joke when, uh, when Amazon bought Whole Foods? Uh, I think it was uh, Jeff Bezos said to Alexa, hey, uh, you, know, what, you know, what can I buy at Whole Foods? And he bought Whole Foods <laughs> or something like that. Uh, <laughs> what, what does that mean uh, in terms of... Uh, how it has access to our most private and most personal details of our lives. Yeah. And, and, and from a foreign policy standpoint, uh, uh, you can see the manipulation cyber tools have created in public thought and uh, public perception and how that socialization of information is used. It's a, it's a whole new realm of warfare that goes from political activity all the way to sabotage of of systems with espionage as part of it. It's a hybrid warfare, right? I mean, it's that sort of idea of hybrid warfare, guerrilla warfare, the uh, Grasimov uh, uh, doctrine sort of approach in a whole new, a whole new level. Blitzkrieg.com. <laughs> we've it's probably we've out there. got going. Well, that's a cheerful subject. Um, one thing that interests me that we didn't talk about before is that um, we're going to see a lot of changes in Senate leadership in foreign policy over the next few years, with Senator Corker um, uh, not standing for re-election and some other people moving on in various ways. How do you see the, sen the, the community of people in the Senate who care about foreign policy? What new directions do you see? What changes? Yeah, I think over the past several years you've had some great uh, uh, breaths of fresh air added to the, the, the foreign policy uh, debate in Congress. I mean, both sides of the aisle have relative, relatively new, relatively younger members of the Senate. Young, young in the Senate is you were elected in the late 1890s. Uh, and uh, I, I joked one day that my favorite part of being in the Senate is hip replacement Wednesdays. Uh, <laughs> and, and so th there are some new younger members, though, that are now in the Senate engaged in foreign policy. And, you know, Bob Corker leaves, I would assume then that, uh, you know, Jim Risch is the ranking member uh, that uh, would be next in line for that, that position. Uh, but you've also got, like, Todd Young, new member of the Senate, who's really engaged uh, human rights issues, uh, done a great job talking about some of the challenges that we have in uh, Saudi Arabia, Yemen, uh, and the, the human rights crisis unfolding uh, in Africa. Uh, excuse me, the, the famine issues. So, so I mean, this is a good dialogue to have, good time to have that change and a, a fresh approach. But we have to not walk away from our engagement. We have to justify that engagement to the American people in a way that perhaps uh, we're not doing a good job of. Uh, you know, through the lens of a, why do we do this? Why is it necessary? What happens if we don't? And then pursue policies that the American people know are in their best interests and that they don't have to be told it's in their best interests, that they understand it's in their best interests. What's your biggest concern looking at the world, the state of American foreign policy? What keeps you up at night? Uh, you and I talked about it. I think it's this, uh, the, the, the systems, the values that the U.S. has been a part of, uh, rule of law, uh, and uh, respect for that rule of law. Uh, the partnerships, the cooperations, the security organizations we've been a part of have all worked. Uh, and these organizations are so important to uh, the stability of, of, of the region's stability of the globe, you know, whether it's our NATO alliance, whether it's the alliances that we've built in Asia, uh, we need to make sure that they're stronger than ever. We need to make sure that we have um, the, the bandwidth, so to speak, to address domestic needs, domestic opportunities, but also strengthening those uh, commitments and partnerships and alliances around the globe. This isn't, this isn't and shouldn't be sort of a zero-sum game. Either you're good at home or you're good abroad, but you can't be both. Um, 
United States is a, a great nation, and it will be made greater uh, both at home and abroad through continued engagement uh, with nations that believe in freedom, democracy, human rights uh, at a level that uh, we can build those economic and security partnerships with. You mentioned earlier that for some there was a you had the George W. Bush administration approach to foreign policy, the Barack Obama approach, and there were people not happy with with either completely and wondering if there wasn't some new approach. You want to say we have a couple of minutes left. Would you like to sort of try to outline some of that for folks? Yeah, you know, I, I guess it comes from that sort of Colorado upbringing. That uh, Colorado is a state that we have our own unique way of doing things. We have a uh, you have arguments about uh, you know right to work states and union states. Uh, we have labor peace law. Uh, you have states that have uh, riparian rights uh, uh, when it comes to water law. It goes back to water again. Uh, riparian rights uh, when it comes to prior appropriations when it comes to water law. We have sort of this system of water courts. We're the only state in the country that has uh, water lawyers and water courts to decide our uh, surface uh, water rights. So we've always kind of found that, that unique way, that third avenue uh, to, to approach things. And perhaps there is a different way. And this notion that I mentioned earlier of conservative internationalism, which focuses on building priorities and, and promoting freedom, this notion of uh, having uh, diplomacy backed by force, uh, but also being make sure, making sure that we have force with our uh, diplomacy, uh, and uh, that we have sort of a opportunities to uh, look at areas where we should be promoting uh, freedom and look at it not just a, a way to say, hey, we're going to have to be everywhere all the time, but to the American people say, we have to be here. Here's why. This is what we're going to do. Do it early. Do it uh, in a way that uh, is uh, responsible with appropriate levels of, of uh, diplomacy uh, backed by force. And, you know, kind of a more strategic, uh, opportune way. And uh, I think that's something the American people will be able to get behind and rally behind. So, um, you know, if, if you want to call it conservative internationalism, if you want to call it something else, but I think it is that third way that fits the sweet spot between uh, the Bush administration, uh, the Obama administration, and perhaps what we need now. All right. Well, thank you very much, Senator. That is a very helpful and forward-looking thought. Uh, those of you who haven't read Henry Now's work, I suggest you go out and do it because it's clearly having an impact on the debate in Washington. Thank you, everyone, for your patience. Sorry we don't have time for audience questions, but the senator really needs to get on to his next appointment. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.